Okay, well, it's three minutes after. Let's get started. So firstly, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining today. This is Crypto, the latest legal and regulatory developments, kindly hosted by Collier Bristow. It's a pleasure to be here today. And thank you so much, uh, Collier, for organizing this event. Um, I should add briefly that Colliers are hosting a number of other online events. So please go to their website to sign up if you haven't already signed up to the mailing list. Also note a follow up email will contain a link to sign up. So let's do some introductions. Um, please also bear with us. Um, we're not all experts using the technology here. So there might be some delays <laughs> switching between slides and we're all going to be sharing our own screens for that purpose when we present. Okay, so my name is Ian Taylor. I am the chair of Crypto UK. We are an industry trade body. I will build on that briefly. I will be talking about public policy and updates in Europe and the UK currently. Then I will hand over to Imogen Jones, who works for Collier Bristol. She'll be giving a legal update including the legal statement on crypto assets and smart contracts in the UK. Then Imogen will pass over to Nigel Brahams, who's also at Colliers. He will be giving an in-depth regulatory update. And then our final panelist or speaker in this virtual space is Max Thieler. Max is at FIDRS and he will be talking about cryptocurrency manipulation and the interesting stablecoin arena. Finally, we'll uh, conclude with some uh, Q&A. Okay, and if I could ask each of the, the panelists when I hand over to them or when they're handed over to, they give a brief introduction themselves. Thank you. All right, so I'm gonna talk for five to 10 minutes um, around uh, what's going on in the, the po public policy uh, domain. Uh, firstly, I'll start with Europe and then I'll move on to the UK. So as digital assets are ready to mainstream, the governments are starting to respond. So a little bit about Crypto UK. We are a trade body, as I mentioned. We have a membership base of approximately 40 in the UK. Um, our vision is that we believe in the transformative, transformative potential of digital and crypto assets and the underlying block, blockchain technology. We promote accountable self-governance whilst advocating for fit-for-purpose legislation and regulatory frameworks for crypto and digital assets in the UK and still within Europe. Our mission was to establish, a, establish and foster productive partnerships between digital and crypto asset industry participants together with the legislator, legislative body, policymakers and regulatory agencies with the primary goal to educate nurture an environment that both fosters innovation and promotes jobs and inward investment within the UK. To do that, we offer working groups for our members to write codes of conduct to ensure behavior within the industry is, is fit for purpose. We educate and inform and advocate through public consultations, which we'll get on to in a minute, and uh, advocacy within the government. Um, we also engage in global uh, partnerships with other trade bodies. I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. Okay, so some of you may well have been aware there was a recent public consultation from the European Commission. This started in, uh, this was released in December last year and just recently closed last month in April. Um, so I'll talk firstly about the main points within that policy, uh, public uh, policy outreach to the community. And then I will talk about a non-paper that was released last week, giving a hint to the community as to what legislation could be coming down the pipe. Okay, so some may still think of digital assets as largely unregulated with little government oversight, but as consumer awareness and in interest in digital assets grow, so does the attention from policymakers around the world. You may well have seen some recent initiatives. Uh, let's start with the US um, recently proposed for the creation of digital dollar wallets as a means to distribute stimulus payments and COVID-19 relief. And interestingly, a digital dollar may not simply be the digitization of fiat currency. Congresswoman Maxine Waters' bill 
um, describes a digital dollar as an electronic unit of value, redeemable by an eligible financial institution as determined by the Board of Governors of the Fed Federal Reserve System, nodding towards the possibility of other digital assets. Oh, pardon me, I didn't put my slides up, did I? Let me do that now. Sorry, bear with me one second. I did mention it wouldn't go perfectly smoothly, so. <laughs> Okay, here we are. Share screen. We'll be right there. Share. There we go. Okay. Uh, oh, but then I haven't got my script. Sorry. Just to show these two slides. This is what I'm talking about. So I'm going to talk about as I said, the main points in the consultation, um, I'll talk about taxonomy, suggested bespoke regime, market integrity, touch on stable coins, um, and market participants. Then I will look to discuss the non-paper that was released last week and pull out the main suggestions as to a new regulatory framework um, within the Eurozone. Okay. Okay, so a couple of other things that came out of the, the, the US recently, you may well have seen um, the SEC, Security Exchange Commission, won their lawsuit, lawsuit against Telegram, halting the Telegram open network, known as TUN, T-O-N, as its native GRAM tokens, G-R-A-M, were deemed unregistered securities. Uh, so we see that policymakers and industry alike continue to grapple with existing clarity around consistent regulatory guidance, especially cross-border. But this looks to change, and this leads me nicely into the European consultation on a framework for markets for crypto assets. So what was in this consultation? So as I said back in 2019, December, the EC undertook an exhaustive a public consultation. This consultation contained more than 150 questions. It considered how crypto assets should be treated within existing EU financial services legislation and whether a bespoke, unfragmented regulatory regime for the European Union was necessary. So I'll talk a little bit about the main questions, as I said, and then, then go on to, to, to what the rumblings are as to what potential regime we, we may see or may not see. So a taxonomy was one of the first major areas and it seemed rather odd to, to myself and to our members that we're still talking about a taxonomy. Um, this is something that I worked on a couple of years ago, uh, involved in another trade body, but the industry pretty much agrees. Um, and I think the folks at the commission do as well, that we have three tokens payment, um, which is a store of value, uh, just like cash unit of account, medium of exchange, utility token so it provides an access to a future benefit um, such as ethereum i know that smart contracts will be talked about by imaging next so you can build on that and then finally a security token which basically gives you a benefit to a real world asset such as gold or an equity or, or or a debt instrument so let me just talk about security tokens uh, and what the commission are thinking right now so security tokens fall within the definition of financial instruments under MIFID II. And those tokens are largely deemed to constitute e-money, where crypto assets do not naturally fall within an existing regulatory perimeter. Uh, we advocate, Crypto UK and the industry, for, um, for a new classification to be created, created, as opposed to where we may have seen awkward attempts uh, made to retrofit uh, such crypto assets into existing frameworks where a natural fit does not exist. Um, there was also language around the hybrid token. So many of you will know a token can start off as a security token, i.e. through an ICO as a fundraising uh, objective. And then once the particular network or project is bootstrapped, um, it can then be a uh, utility token, i.e. decentralized. And we have seen some examples of that in the, in the US with Ethereum. Uh, 
One thing I should mention as well, just touching on the US again, there has been some good work from the SEC with regards to the potential safe harbor approach, which would allow for uh, the, this hybrid token not to have to register as security if certain uh, standards are met, such as decentralization. Yeah. Just quickly, uh, Pardon? Your, your slides have come off the screen. If there was a request for some, to put your slides back on. Okay. Yeah, I'll put them on in a minute because I just want to read some something from my script here. I didn't print it out. Apologies. Uh, slides will go back on, on in a moment, folks. Okay, so let me talk a little bit about, um, so just to finish up the, the, the other major areas other than taxonomy, stable coins, uh, market participants and market integrity. So to talk about a non, the non-paper. So firstly, what is a non-paper? Um, this was published um, from the commission. However, it is not any formal policy. Um, it just seeks to really garner a view from member states uh, as to potential uh, legislation that does, that does come out further down the line. We've had no date as to when this legislation will come, um, so we will see. It's not an official position as, as they state themselves. So this paper drilled down into two areas, um, crypto assets that would qualify as financial instruments um, and would therefore be within the scope of existing legislation under MIFID II and crypto assets such as utility tokens, payment tokens that fall outside of the existing legislation. This is all pretty known, this isn't new stuff, but what, it, what is new is really in regards to some of the suggestions around how they're going to uh, formalize this. So if I just move down here. So I'll just quickly talk about uh, security tokens, if they do fall under MIFI 2 and the industry is largely in agreement with the commission here. Um, and they suggest that that security tokens should be retrofit into the existing uh, regulation. So the papers of this non-paper suggested three possible options for uh, security tokens. One, non-legislative measures providing guidance on whether and how existing legislation applies to crypto assets and security tokens. Or two, a targeted legislative changes, removing provisions acting as barriers to the issuance, trading and post-trading security tokens and the use of DLT-based solutions. And three, a pilot regime. So for example, a three-year period creating a new DLT market infrastructure allowing for the trading and or settlement of security tokens. And so that's security tokens. And then finally, let's talk about a bespoke regime for non-security tokens, i.e. payment and utility tokens, which this section includes stable coins. Um, so according to the non-paper, mo most respondents to the consultation agree that a creation of a bespoke regime for crypto assets uh, that fall outside the current perimeter um, is relevant. Um, the respondents believe this is beneficial to sustainable growth of the crypto asset ecosystem. Um, and so therefore the paper suggests two approaches. So option one is what they call an opt-in regime. This would apply to all issuers and service providers who are subject to EU law. Partic participants would benefit from EU passporting, enabling them to extend their services cross-border within the Eurozone. Participants who do not opt in would be subject to their existing national regimes and would not be granted the ability to passport their services. And then the second option is called a fully harmonized regime for service providers, particularly exchanges and custodial wallets. Um, participants would be subject to EU law and therefore would benefit from the EU passporting um, and therefore existing national regulatory regimes on cryptocurrencies would no longer be applicable. Um, and so option two suggests four pillars. I'll quickly just mention these. Uh, number one, issuers will be required to provide clear, accurate, not non-misleading information through an informative document, such as a white paper. Uh, providers would also be subject to rules preventing conflicts of interest, uh, meeting prudential and capital requirements and business continuity measures, for example. Uh, thirdly, increased consumer protection and market integrity measures 
And then final fourth pillar, supervision of issuance of and the services relating to crypto assets by non-compliant agreements. Okay, so let me put my slides back up. Um, I won't necessarily talk about stable coins because I know Max is gonna do that. So put my slide back up, one second. Okay, sorry about this folks. So let's talk about, so just a brief conclusion um, is that the industry found the, the non-paper, which as I stated is not a guarantee as to what legislation will come, quite well thought out. Um, and I did also personally believe that we're heading in the right direction with, with, with this outcome. Um, and then so to close off on upcoming consultations in the UK, you, you may well be aware that the Bank of England is looking to consult with the industry regarding CBDCs, so central bank digital currencies is another hot topic right now. There's lots of research out there. We at Crypto UK will be responding to this. The deadline is June the 20th. If anybody wants to participate, please, please reach out to me at the contact details shortly. Also, Treasury are releasing two um, public consultations later this year they've been put on hold because of COVID-19. Uh, the first one is a broader regulatory approach so this would be similar to what we just saw with, with the eurozone that includes stable coins um, and then the second one is around uh, financial promotions we've already seen some consultations from from the SCA in regards to this previously and then finally there's uh, more general money laundering and uh, terrorism financing coming out of the eurozone. Okay, well, there's me. Um, I hope I haven't overrun too much. Thank you very much for listening. I will then hand over to Imogen. And Imogen, I believe you're gonna share your, your slides yourself, yep? Great, thank you. All right, there we go. Hopefully everyone can see those. Um, thanks, Ian. So I am Imogen. I'm an associate in the Banking and Finance Litigation Department at Collier Bristow. And I'm going to be giving a legal update. And in particular, um, looking at the legal statement on crypto assets and smart contracts. So this was published in November of 2019 by the UK Jurisdiction Task Force, which is made up of various representatives from the legal world. And it followed a consultation which came out in May 2019. And one of the th key things that came out of this paper was a lack of confidence in the market. Therefore, the aim of the report was to address some of these issues and to provide confidence, legal certainty, and hopefully some more predictability in the area. So it's worth first pointing out that this legal statement is not a statute and it's not a statement of law. It's a report containing answers to the questions arising out of the consultation. The aim of which is to advise future reform of law. It's not binding on the courts or in the legislature. However, the authors do note that the common law system of England and Wales has a level of flexibility beyond legislative intervention. And I think it's obvious from the drafting of the legal statement that they're trying to capitalise on this. And they provide reasons as to why the court can be flexible with existing definitions in the hope that judges may in turn apply the statement's reasoning. And this has actually been done in a case in the UK in January, um, which I'll expand on later. So the report stayed away from regulation of crypto assets, and they also stayed away from taxation, criminal law, partnership, data protection, IP, consumer protection. And they decided that most of these things were best dealt with by other bodies or by um, statute or legislation. And they didn't deal with whether or not crypto assets would be considered to be money. So they were just looking at two specific questions. Are crypto assets, can they be considered property? And can smart con contracts be considered legally binding contracts under English law? So first, crypto assets, what are they? Well, I'm not gonna give a detailed definition of crypto assets because hopefully most people know what they are and I'm sure many of you can probably give a better definition than I can. 
but it is important in this context to note how the legal statement defines crypto assets. And it does so in relation to the particular novel characteristics of crypto assets. So the statement quite rightly recognizes that the term crypto asset covers a variety of different representations. That in itself is problematic when trying to fit crypto assets into an existing legal system, and it's unlikely to be a one size fits all. However, they've looked at the principal, novel and characteristic features of crypto assets, and they note that these features are what give rise to much of the debate about whether or not you can give a proprietary status to crypto assets. So then we have to look at what is property. Again, this is an incredibly wide topic. But the legal statement looked at two particular definitions, one from a case in 1965 and a more recent decision in 2013. I've listed um, below the, the key characteristics coming out of these. And you ask, why does it matter if crypto assets are property? Well, property rights are recognized around the world and there are consequences to something having property rights. The legal remedies available if something is lost, stolen, or lawfully taken, there's injunctions, security trusts, um, and impacts on insolvency. So it can have a large impact whether or not crypto assets are dealt with as property. And that in itself will hopefully give confidence in the market. So the legal statement addresses these key characteristics and in relation to crypto assets in explaining why they think crypto assets can have the characteristics of property. So if we use the example of Bitcoin, if you look at the public parameter, the ledger, that allows Bitcoin to be identified and therefore it can be defined. The private key permits the holder and only that holder to deal in Bitcoin and this establishes a level of control and exclusivity. Ownership is a little more complicated and as a private key can be known by multiple people. Now this will have to probably be dealt with case by case, but as Bitcoin can be transferred to a third party, whereby the original owner can no longer transfer the same Bitcoin, it's considered to fit within this definition and has possibilities of assignment and transfer of ownership. There's also a level of permanence, enough to meet similarly financial assets which can be cancelled, redeemed, repaid. So for all of these reasons, the statement decided, and I think rightly so, that crypto assets have all the characteristics of property and their novel features don't disqualify them from being property. So this is sound reasoning as to why hopefully they'll be considered by the courts to be property. The legal statement also dealt with a number of distinct issues and was comprehensive in answering a lot of the questions which may arise. I'm not going to go into all of them now, but I think that one key point that's still outstanding is jurisdiction and governing law, which the legal statement thought would be best dealt with by legislation. I think it's likely this will be dealt with on a case by case basis by the courts taking into consideration specific factors, such as if there's an underlying contract which has a jurisdiction clause, or whether the asset can be linked to a person in a particular jurisdiction. I think it may also be approached by considering whether there is a reason that the jurisdiction or law that is argued could not or should not be the appropriate law and forum. Um, but we'll have to see how that's developed because there is still no case law in that area. So to come to what I think is the most interesting area as a litigator, although I'm probably that's probably relative, um, is the case law. And we've seen quite a significant development in the last six months and in the last year. So the first case that's being referred to regularly is B2C2, which isn't directly applicable in the UK as it's a case from Singapore. However, it did decide that crypto assets constituted property capable of being held on trust. And it's been referenced in both the legal statements and in cases that we've seen in the UK. The first and the only case we have seen of, of about crypto assets in the UK since the legal statement is AA versus Unknown, which was heard in December 2019, shortly after the publication, and we got judgment in January 2020. So in short, this was an application made by an English insurance company who are the insurer of the claimants, and the claimant was the victim of blackmail using malware by the first event and the insurer paid the ransom of the requested Bitcoin to obtain the code to restore the claimant's encrypted files. There was a number of applications, but these were narrowed during the course of the hearing to only include a proprietary injunction in respect of the Bitcoin held at the account of the fourth defendant. All other parts were adjourned. This was due to issues with jurisdiction. So Mr. Justice Bryan granted an order for proprietary injunction, thereby finding crypto assets to be property. 
that he found some difficulty in his judgment in reconciling crypto assets with the legal definition of property, which is enshrined in case law. However, he referred to the legal statement, and although he noted that it's not a statement of law, he intended to adopt their reasoning as to why crypto assets can be considered to be property and why there was no reason why they shouldn't be considered to be property. He agreed with the reasoning and in turn granted a proprietary injunction. I think it's worth briefly mentioning a couple of cases that we've seen in other jurisdictions this year because it has been quite a year already for um, case law in this area. We've seen two cases in Australia and New Zealand where crypto assets were treated as property. In Hague, the Australian courts allowed crypto assets to be used as security, overcoming some issues of stability by including some specific requirements. And in Cryptopia, we saw the context of a liquidation, crypto assets were held to be property. We also have a case in France, which is Bitspread versus Paymium, where Bitcoin was treated as money. It was like a fungible asset where gains made during the lifetime of a loan were retained by the borrower. This is obviously a slightly different conclusion to the other cases, but it's still a significant development in how we will consider crypto assets. I think following these cases it is likely that the courts will continue this approach and hopefully it will provide some certainty and it will improve market confidence with crypto assets. It may also mean that we see more litigation in this area as claimants will have more confidence in the outcome of their cases. Courts are showing that they have an ability to be flexible in their approach. I think this was particularly seen in the Australian case and they found solutions to the specific novelty, novelties of crypto assets rather than finding them just to be barriers. So I'm briefly going to talk about smart contracts, which is the other half of the legal statement. The key issue to be addressed in relation to smart contracts is whether they can be legally binding contracts under English law. This is obviously really important as it gives rise to potential remedies and enforceability of these contracts, without which there's almost no confidence in smart contracts being used in England and Wales. So the key features of smart contracts are they're automatic, that the terms are recorded in code and that the code executes or performs the contract. Now under English law, the requirements for a legally binding contract are that there is agreements, an intention to be legally bound and consideration. In principle, smart contracts can meet these requirements. The role of the software in smart contracts might vary between the contracts. However, the key requirement remains, what is the intention of the parties? And that's something that the courts are generally familiar with assessing. So the key issue will be how the English courts will apply the general principles of contract law to a smart contract, which is written wholly or part in computer code. The main challenge, I think, will be interpretation and intention. The authors of the legal statement propose that the court should still look to the intention of the parties in the same way and interpret the language by reference to the reasonable person. That's something the courts are very versed in doing. And the statement also believes, and I, I tend to agree, that, that in the extreme example where a contract is purely code, it should be read like plain language from which there is no justification to depart. And that follows well-known contractual principles. The intention of the parties is likely to be the intention of the writers of the code, or it may be the intention of those entering into an underlying contract. It's not going to be the computer at the specific moment that the contract is formed. The courts may have to determine whether the code was intended to define the obligations or simply to implement them, and they may look outside the code to determine the agreement between the parties. Other issues include whether there are any barriers to smart contracts being able to fulfill particular requirements of some contracts, and the legal statement does try to address some of these, the first being anonymity. It's likely in the case of a smart contract that both parties could be anonymous but there is no requirement under English contract law for parties to know the identity of the other party, and therefore this shouldn't be a barrier. Some contracts have requirements for signatures or for the contract itself to be in writing. A private key can meet signature requirements, and this is generally in line with the development in case law at the moment surrounding electronic signatures. We're seeing it in emails and a variety of different electronic signatures. Particularly, I'm sure we've seen this develop um, during the COVID-19 pandemic where things can't be signed by hand and pen and paper. The legal statement also thinks that code is perfectly, uh, perfectly capable of meeting writing requirements and we would hope that the court would apply the same logic. So the conclusion reached was that in principle, a smart contract can be a contract under English law, but in the same vein, it needs to be considered, as with any other contract, as to whether it meets the requirements. 
and would need to be assessed on a case-by-case -case basis for specific issues. There are quite a few issues that are left to be dealt with, um, things such as how are terms incorporated into the contract, particularly communications beyond the code itself, how to deal with any amendments to the terms, whether any accompanying explanations are incorporated, and in terms of breach, how will we determine what is fair and reasonable when the contract is automatically fulfilled, which party is going to be responsible for coding errors, the potential mismatch between what parties have agreed and what the smart contract code executes, which can lead to disputes in regards to performance and um, fault, and jurisdictional issues, particularly in regards to performance because where ledgers are decentralized, pinpointing the exact location of failure can be difficult and complicated. So we would look to case law to see how this would develop. Now the growth in the use of smart contracts has so far been achieved within a jurisprudential vacuum. There is little to no case law, legislation or regulation, which addresses or even considers the legal implications of this technology. The result of this is that there is a lack of certainty, and I think it's likely that this is what's inhibited the more widespread adoption of smart contracts in the last couple of years. The only case we really have to refer to is BTC2, and as I've said, this isn't directly applicable in the UK, but it is a case that determines questions of automated contracts. In this case, the court had to assess whether a contract performed by algorithms without human intention was a legally binding contract. And they were also asked to assess how the doctrine of mistake should be approached in the context of automated contracts and how is knowledge to be determined for these purposes. The court looked at the intention of the programmers when the program was written and not when the contract was entered into, as that intention would have been purely a computer. So on this basis, they found there was no mutual mistake and the defence of mistake failed. I think a similar approach is likely to be taken by the UK courts in relation to smart contracts and it's in line with the thoughts expressed in the legal statements. It also applies existing contract law principles to smart contracts, which is something the court should be capable of doing. But it does throw up the issue that there is a need for more precedence before parties are going to feel comfortable using smart contracts. I do think that hopefully we will see the growth in smart contract litigation as we have done with crypto assets and the much needed development of the jurisprudence in this area but it might require some legislative intervention to get to where we need to be. And until then, I don't think we will see as much development in the use of smart contracts until we can find some more confidence. And I'm not sure the legal statement really answered all of those questions. Um, I'll pass on to Nigel. Thank you very much, Imogen. Thank you very much, Ian. Um, both very interesting talks. I'm gonna be talking about the UK regulatory aspects of crypto so um, I won't have Ian's breadth in terms of looking at what's going on in other jurisdictions to the same degree or they will be sort of considering those issues um, so I'm dealing more in terms of where we are now in terms of the FCA and what they think about crypto um, I'm going to share my slides on screen hopefully that will work hopefully my kids won't come in while I'm doing this okay. Okay, so I'm just by way of explanation, I'm a partner at Collier Bristow. I'm also the head of FinTech and I'm a partner in the corporate team. And I've been working with um, uh, companies in the crypto space now for probably at least five years. Um, prior to that, I was a senior in-house lawyer working in derivatives and I found having expertise in derivatives and crypto actually has a, a great deal of overlap. So, um, so just a bit of base, some basics on the um, UK um, position. I'm just so. So, in in the UK, we have this concept of the regulatory perimeter, and this is the effectively the um, dividing line between services which are regulated and services which are unregulated. I spend a lot of my time advising clients on this uh, so-called perimeter. And um, as you can imagine, my clients who are not regulated are always very keen to stay on the unregulated side. And there's a there's a kind of quite a grey area between what is and what isn't regulated. And I think that and and thanks to the efforts of people like Ian, that's becoming a less grey area, and the perimeter is becoming more clearly defined. And I think that's only only for the good. Um, so the basic premise under the Financial Services and Markets Act, which is the principal piece of legislation governing uh, UK regulation. Um, 
is the what's called the general prohibitions that no person can carry on regulated activity in the United Kingdom unless they are an authorised person or an exempt person. Now you might think that's a very old act, 20 years old, I mean 2000 doesn't seem very long ago to me but it would, it is actually, it's quite a long time in terms of this sort of development but the FISMA as it's known is updated very very regularly so FISMA now is not FISMA as it was in 2000. Um, the other point I wanted to cover just up front is financial promotions which is the process of inviting people to engage in investment uh, and you can't sell a financial product in the UK unless you're compliant with the financial promotion rules. Um, then additionally under the F under FISMA there's something called the Regulated Activities Order or RAO and this is provides detailed guidance and it's something we look at very regularly when we're considering crypto um, um, opportunities or projects um, and we have to consider whether or not something can could possibly constitute an investment of one sort or another, typically e-money, collective investment schemes, debt, securities, derivatives, etc. And then we also look at the activities, which could be arranging, um, advising, dealing, etc. So um, initially, um, obviously we know Bitcoin's been around since 2009. Um, the UK has been fairly quiet on the subject. Um, obviously, as we're probably all aware, there are plenty of countries which banned it, like China and Pakistan, Egypt, etc., and certain countries who are very, very supportive, which I've also listed here. Um, I would describe, and I'd be interested in Ian's views on this later on, but I would describe the UK as broadly supportive of crypto, albeit for many years rather silent on the subject. Um, and I would say that crypto kind of well, Bitcoin really, when we talk about crypto, Bitcoin, Ether, trading cryptocurrency stayed really a bit under the radar really until the ICO boom. And again, this is more by way of background. Um, as we're all aware, there was this massive boom in ICOs in 2017. Um, there was quite a lot of discussion about, I, I advised on probably 15 or so of these and the constant theme there was what we're doing is not regulated because we're because we're not issuing a security. And there's a great deal of focus on creating um, what they're known as utility tokens. And I'm going to talk more about that um, when I talk about the more recent UK guidance. But the problem we had was that um, there were very large volumes and a lot of retail investors lost their shirts. And I would say one thing about the UK regulatory um, system, above all else, it's there to protect small investors. Just if you kind of, have that in your mindset whenever you look at regulation in the UK. It, it can take you an awfully long way towards understanding why the FCA are doing the things they're doing. They are just, it's public relations thing. They are very, very concerned about small investors losing money, especially losing their life savings. Um, it's about protecting people almost from themselves. Um, of course, many of the startups who raised money in uh, issuing um, ICOs raised that money in Ether or Bitcoin and of course these collapsed in 2018 and some of these companies went with them along with a few people I knew in, in that space. Um, and this created an increasing amount of regulatory scrutiny and you've seen pronouncements by the SEC on this subject and um, there were plenty of rather more negative sentiment after the sort of boom of 2017. So what did the FCA have to say about this? Initially, um, one thing I think is quite interesting and, then, and it's just worth bearing in mind is that the FCA is a principles-based regulator, which is quite different from the SEC in the US, which is a rules-based regulator. And you may ask why that's so important. In the US, the general principle is if something, if it doesn't fit within the rules, it's banned. Whereas in the UK, normally things need to fit within a definition. If they're not within the definition of security, then they're not a security. And the FCA has quite a, quite a flexible approach in terms of interpretation. And that's actually quite helpful in the space. And one of the reasons why I think the UK is quite a popular venue for, for crypto. Um, even so, when ICOs were becoming very hot around November 2017, the FCA made the statement, which was an almost really a lawyer's charter because it just said some ICOs fall outside the regulated space, some fall inside, and it really depends on the nature of, that, of the structure. And this is exactly what people are in are trying to... Um, we're trying to advance from that situation in order and have much more clarity. We, don't, we didn't have that then. The further FCA statement in April 2018 was quite helpful. It said that we did not consider cryptocurrencies to be currencies or commodities for regulatory purposes. Um, 
but if you are issuing derivatives based on them, those will be covered by the FCA rules. So although crypto was not treated as a as currency, from a regulatory perspective, I think it was. And the reason for this is FX um, payment, FX trading, spot FX trading is not regulated in the UK. However, um, if you make if you if you um, trade in currency options, that is a regulated activity. And I think the FCA were taking the view, albeit they were not saying as much, that to treat crypto or treat Bitcoin like money, even if it is not money. We've then had we've then sort of taken gone fast forward. And in October 2018, the Crypto Assets Task Force issued its final report. And this was an interesting piece of work because it was partly because of the members of the task force, which were HM Treasury, Bank of England, and the FCA. And what's interesting here is it was the first attempt to marry taxonomy. Taxonomy, from those funny words, I never understood, I never even heard of the word taxonomy until I um, became a crypto lawyer. A taxonomy basically means a definition, it's a sort of fine finely tuned definition of what is and what isn't um, within, this, within the definition of cryptocurrency or particular type of cryptocurrency. And what I liked about their approach is they just took what people were doing in the marketplace um, and, and how people were defining crypto effectively between three different types of crypto, which I'm going to talk about on the next page. Um, and then we had the FCA consultation paper 19.3 in January 2019 which was a very expansive, very well-written paper. Um, it was sent out and it invited many participants in the marketplace to comment on it and provide feedback. So it was fed back on crypto participants, banks, financial services firms, law firms. And as a result of that, the FCA issued its policy statement, 1922, the clue being the word 19 is that's the year, and 22 being that was the 22nd policy statement the FCA had issued that year. In addition to that, they issued perimeter guidance. Uh, and you me I mentioned earlier on what perimeter guidance was. That is the guidance as to whether something is one side of the perimeter or the other side. And this is a rather helpful statement of the bleeding obvious here, where they said, given the complexity of many tokens, it's not always easy to determine whether a token is a specified investment. Never a truer word spoken by the regulator. So they, all three of those documents use what were really established um, classifications or taxonomy, if you like, of tokens. You had exchange tokens by means of exchange, like Bitcoin and Litecoin. I'm going to talk about each of these in more detail. Utility tokens, which were really redeemed for platform or service access, or security tokens, which Ian's already alluded to in quite a lot of detail, which are really just securities delivered by a crypto or blo uh, blockchain methodology. So exchange tokens, essentially things like Bitcoin, Ether, Litecoin, these are, they're not regarded as money by the FCA. Um, the FCA continues, has actually given a clear statement they do not regard these as regulated instruments. Um, however, um, they, one of the interesting comments the FCA came out with was that if you are using exchange tokens to do what is essentially a regulated activity, i.e. Um, payments, particularly payments, this could be a regulated activity. So that sort of brings, the, brings Bitcoin, regular cryptocurrencies more into the mainstream. And then the big issue which came up earlier this year with the expansion of the money laundering regulations uh, to include crypto. And um, I think this is going to have it's having quite a big effect on participants in the UK market, um, and I think this is something that, interestingly, when you've read the consultation paper, was something which many market participants urged the FCA to do. Now, to talk quickly about utility tokens. So, as I mentioned, when I was giving during 2017, early 2018, I always seem to be doing a uh, regulatory opinion pretty much every week or two for a um, issuer of uh, ICOs. And all of them really were desperate that their token should be a utility token and not a security token. Um, I like to give this example, I've given it a hundred times, so apologies for anybody who's heard it before. Imagine I was building a gym post COVID-19 and I wanted to finance that gym. I could issue you with debt or equity, which would give you um, either a repayment or rights to share the profits. But those are definitely securities, no doubt about it, whether they're issued in tokens or anything else. 
bit of asset to you, you can have access to my gym um, uh, up for, for two years. That could be a utility token because it's paid in return for a utility. Um, now, um, these are not always regulated, but, you, but what I find recently, uh, I, I've been doing a lot of analysis around e-money and whether or not certain types of utility token meet the definition of e-money. And the other area which you have to be very careful around is collective investment schemes. So these are two areas I would say I focus on most of all when I'm looking at so-called utility tokens. Um, a collective investment scheme is a, basically a group scheme run by somebody to invest in just about anything, and that's the risk with collective investment schemes. You can have collective investment schemes around betting. You can have around, I've seen them around ownership of horse race horses, ownership of fine wines, ownership of art. All of those could apply, and particularly property, really real property. Um, the other thing I've seen a lot of attention on around now is stable coins. And Ian again mentioned those in his talk, and I know Max is going to talk more about stable coins, so I'm not going to steal his fire here. Um, but we are seeing stable coins which are linked increasingly to real currency or to real assets like gold. And again, there's a lot of discussion around whether or not those could be e-money. Um, and and you have to, you know, I find myself looking at the definition of e-money very, very closely and thinking very, very hard about whether something is or isn't e-money because there is a very strong risk when you're dealing with stable coins that you could be creating an electronic money one sort or another. I'm almost finished. I'm just going to mention briefly security tokens. I know that Ian's mentioned these already. Without going into too much detail, these are effectively, these are securities. These are regulated securities. The only difference I see between these and what we're dealing with most of the time now is these are delivered through a blockchain. These are delivered using the fine new technology that we are experiencing with cryptocurrencies. The reality, these are just shares. These are debt instruments. And they are definitely within the regulated perimeter. In fact, the FCA has said that anything they call a security token is by definition inside the regulated perimeter. Um, and there are the usual, and this is my last slide, there are a number of different rules around this, particularly around issuing prospectuses. And these would apply to security tokens in the same way as they would apply to any other issuance of a uh, security, albeit not through this methodology of token tokenization. So um, I'm going to sort of wrap up here and see if I can move my, get rid of my slides. Um, and I'm now going to be handing over to Max for, who's going to talk about market manipulation. I know you're going to talk about stable coins. So I'll, over to you. Hey, thank you very much, Nigel. Uh, just Get my slides up here. Okay. Um, right, so uh, my name is Max. Um, I want to say first of all, thank you to uh, the fine folks at Collier Bristol for having me on. Uh, I am a director at Federis Partners. We are a economic consultancy specializing in litigation with offices in London and uh, New York, uh, as well as other cities around the world. Um, our, um, our contact with the world of crypto uh, comes in a slightly different manner, I think, from some of the other presentations we've seen today. Uh, we are connected to and we've done analysis for cases involving uh, financial litigation around uh, the manipulation of cryptocurrencies. Um, and I, I think the sort of best thing we can contribute to this, this panel and this uh, seminar is um, sort of a discussion of a case study of one of these cases and what we kind of think it means, um, you know, for the bigger picture of not, not only how regulators uh, and courts are treating these, these new assets that are uh, in our world now, but how markets are treating them and whether they look like something we've seen before. Um, I think although we're only going to walk through sort of a single case study to, to talk about, um, you know, the connection between different kinds of cryptocurrencies and, and how they operate, I guess if there's, if there's a, a, a broader conclusion or a headline or a, a thesis statement, if you will, for this, this presentation, it's that um, the potential for manipulation of cryptocurrency prices, at least in the form that we're going to talk about, uh, is really actually very traditional in some ways. There's nothing about the um, sort of 
underlying technology that enables this kind of manipulation. This, this emerges from uh, a, a new form of asset or a new form of currency, whichever you like, um, which uh, is still emerging and which doesn't have fully transparent or fully mature institutions yet, which uh, kind of affords some opportunities, um, one of which we're going to talk about here. So the much prefaced discussion of stable coins. Um, this is a, a snapshot, basically, of the five largest cryptos in the world by uh, USD uh, value in terms of both trading volume and market cap. Uh, the point that um, I want to make with this slide, which uh, is, you know, this is, a 20, this is just a taken from um, a website called CoinMarketCap um, about a week ago, and I was putting the slides together. The point that I want to make here is um, you're probably familiar with Bitcoin, the sort of flagship uh, cryptocurrency of everything, uh, and indeed, you can see from the market cap, uh, figures here that Bitcoin is uh, by far the largest store of value in uh, the crypto world. Almost all crypto value is held in Bitcoins. It's actually not the most common unit of exchange. That's this other cryptocurrency called Tether, um, which if you're uh, you know, at all familiar with this world, you've probably heard of. Tether is, uh, at least in you know, trading volume, uh, the most commonly used cryptocurrency in that it's uh, transacted most frequently. Uh, and it's even though the sort of overall market cap, the amount of value that's held in Tether, you know, on individual accounts is actually quite low compared to Bitcoin. So um, the reason for that is because Tether is the most prominent of the stable coins, which we've been promising we'll talk about. So here we go. Um, stable coins, uh, the whole premise of a stable coin is that you have pegged your, uh, the value of your asset, of your, your crypto, to uh, some kind of a, an asset in the conventional or fiat economy. So uh, Tether is perhaps the most basic example in that it's simply pegged to the U.S. dollar, uh, much like some uh, non-U.S. currencies are. And the way that that uh, pegging is maintained is similar to uh, foreign exchange peggings in that uh, they simply keep a reserve in which um, every Tether issued corresponds to a Tether in the reserve. And the two can be uh, ostensibly uh, traded um, in, you know, in sufficiently large amounts one to one. So uh, if you're on an exchange, you can purchase some Tether with another crypto. Uh, when I say exchange, I mean a cryptocurrency exchange. Uh, and you can be relatively sure that the Tether you've just purchased uh, is going to have the exact same value or almost exactly the same value as uh, a US dollar. And so that way you can kind of control your exposure to dollars and you can, you can manage the volatility of your assets in, in a, let's, let's face it, a relatively volatile um, marketplace. So um, simple diagram of that, that value proposition and how that works is here. So basically, uh, you know, if you have a large uh, Bitcoin portfolio and you want to cash out and convert yourself to USD, um, you could go directly into a fiat currency, although um, a minority of exchanges will actually let you do this directly. Um, or you could go to Tether um, much more quickly and uh, with much, much lower overhead. So Often these sort of cash out transactions need to happen fast because markets are volatile. So Tether is quite attractive for a lot of traders uh, in terms of a way to save money on converting to USD and to get it done quickly before prices move too much. And the reason that you can be sure about this and you can be sure that your transaction into Tether is gonna work uh, is because Tether Limited has promised you um, that they are maintaining this peg and they are putting a dollar into a bank account every time Tether is issued. Uh, so for every Tether that exists in the world, every Tether you buy with a Bitcoin, there is a bank account uh, in the Bahamas I believe, supposedly, uh, which has $1 in it. And at some point that Tether can be exchanged for that dollar. And therefore, uh, the value of Tether maintains a one-to-one -one peg. So that's kind of the premise of a, of a stable coin. Tether is a stable coin to the US dollar. Um, so how does, and we'll get to the manipulation in a moment, but just to discuss how, how Tether comes into the world. Um, the company that, that runs Tether uh, claims that new mintings are prompted by investors making large cash deposits, which are equivalent. So if I'm uh, sort of a, a crypto VIP, and I want to create, you know, uh, 500,000 new Tether, um, then I go to this company and I give them $500,000 for their account and they issue 500,000 new Tethers. Um, but exactly how this process works uh, is pretty opaque. We don't really know who are making these big investments. Tether is not transparent about any of this. Um, and the issuances themselves are timed uh, sporadically and in sort of unpredictable amounts. So um, we're not seeing like a steady flow and we're not seeing like a, a recurring pattern. Um, what we're seeing in the way that Tether is issued is essentially um, mysterious. Uh, the other important thing to note about Tether um, is that the way that they talk about the reserves are uh, inconsistent and they have been shifted, sort of walked back over time. So there's been a lot of skepticism ever since Tether's debut that this, that this bank account was actually being maintained properly and that there actually was a one-to-one -one peg um, and Tether has been uh, cagey about it, to say the least, as we'll, we'll get to in a moment. So um, 
the connection between Tether and Bitcoin, if you go back to the slide here, is, is fairly important, I think, at a systemic level for the entire uh, crypto economy. The fact that Tether is the, the predominant uh, method of exchange between cryptocurrencies uh, and the fact that Bitcoin is the predominant store of value um, means that the sort of relationship between these two is not only symbiotic in the sense that Tether makes Bitcoin a more attractive investment because you can always you can be assured that you can always cash into dollar without having to actually leave a cryptocurrency exchange. Um, it also kind of props up the value of uh, the system as a whole because it, it adds an element of uh, sort of stability and uh, known um, you know pricing out. So Tether and Tether is a systemically important cryptocurrency uh, for those reasons. Um, and so that's why it's kind of important that uh, this sort of pegging methodology and issuing methodology are understood um, and they more or less are not by anyone who's outside these companies. So um, the, there's been skepticism for a lot longer than this, but I think kind of the, the, the way that it came to a head for the most part was in 2018, um, these two economists named Griffin and Shem uh, put out a paper that showed uh, Bitcoin prices around Tether issu issuances had a V-shaped pattern. Um, and they basically in the paper alleged that uh, the Tether issuances were not being timed according to just random investors wanting to, to get involved in Bitcoin, but were actually being used systematically to manipulate the price of Bitcoin. Uh, and so the, the allegations were basically that um, some sort of Tether issuer would um, produce a bunch of Tether uh, and they would buy up a bunch of Bitcoin causing the price to increase and therefore, uh, you know, benefit on Bitcoin long positions that they might have themselves already had. So derivatives or standing Bitcoin they already had it would go up in value because they pushed the price upward through a Tether issuance. Uh, this kind of price manipulation would have been very, very hard to do with uh, sort of an equivalent amount of value if 100 thousand, you know, uh, enough tether to cause the price of Bitcoin to actually shift is being pumped into the system to actually back it all up with dollars would require quite a few dollars. Um, so the fact that these uh, manipulations are going on was, uh, or at least allegedly going on, um, was kind of connected inextricably to the idea that perhaps uh, the peg wasn't being maintained as tightly as it should have been. So this is um, some work that we've done just kind of uh, replicating the work that was done in Griffin and Shem, or at least looking into it using actual um, sort of blockchain data. Uh, and sure enough, you can see that if you take uh, average uh, median end of day uh, Bitcoin returns in the price before and after the issuance of Tether over a certain period of time, I believe this is a couple of years um, leading up to 2019, uh, you can see that the median change in price drops down and then goes back up again. So this is kind of a more granular version of that same chart. Essentially, uh, you know, normalized Bitcoin returns around Tether issuances give this U shape. Tether seems to come out at a trough of Bitcoin prices. So according to the Griffin and Shem paper, uh, the, whoever is, in, is deciding when to issue Tether, which is essentially the uh, employees and owners of uh, the owning company of Tether, um, are waiting for troughs uh, and attempting to sort of stabilize the price of Bitcoin with these issuances and thereby driving up the price. Um, and when they are doing this, um, they may well be uh, doing this additional sort of piece of manipulation, which would be to issue the Tether without actually backing it up with a peg. And part of what might be enabling them to do that, at least in the short term, is that an issuance of Tether uh, that drives up the price of Bitcoin, if you know um, that it's going to happen, you can uh, go long on Bitcoin and use the profits from your uh, sort of super competitive returns to having foreknowledge of what the market's going to do to actually pay for the Tether you just issued. So if you issue 100,000 Tether without anything in the bank, and then you make 200,000 on uh, knowing that the price of Bitcoin is going to go up, you can then put your 100,000 into the bank, back up the Tether you just issued, uh, and thereby come out with 100,000 in profit. Um, so this kind of manipulation um, is essentially alleged without being known for sure, but this is, this is the subject of a major class action in the US. Um, one of the kind of more perhaps outlandish or uh, wider accusations that the Griffin and Shem paper was making was that actually the uh, kind of infamous late 2017 Bitcoin price bubble was caused by uh, manipulative tether issuances. So this is um, this is just a chart that kind of you know shows the evidence for that claim. Basically, there were a large number of very large tether issuances right around the moment that the price of Bitcoin shot up. Um, this is totally consistent with uh, the Griffin and Shem theory in the sense that uh, these issuances might indeed be driving Bitcoin prices up by by reflecting new tether entering the system being used to buy Bitcoin. Um, but to be fair to tether, uh, this pattern is also consistent with the idea that there were simply a number of very, very large investors who were interested in crypto markets during the bubble and wanted to buy in with Tether. So 
Um, this isn't proof of anything by itself, but there's certainly an interesting pattern to look at and see that these issuances do line up at least um, ahead of you know, 2019, uh, in large part with the big uh, Bitcoin bubble at the end of 2017. So what do we know about this reserve? Um, basically, Tether has sort of, when, when they emerged as a, as a stable coin, they were very firm. They said, yes, we definitely back up everything one-to-one -one with dollars, and we retain a professional auditing company, which regularly proves this, although they never published it. Um, and then in the last year, in 2019, um, over the course of the year, this sort of started to get walked back. So the, the website was updated a few times. Uh, for a while they said, okay, well, maybe we aren't audited, but um, we do have a professional sort of oversight. Um, they eventually fired the auditing company that was supposedly doing this. Um, and then uh, at some point in March, uh, they even just took down altogether the claim from the website that they were backed up one-to-one -one by dollars and replaced it with a statement that uh, they had assets on hand equivalent to the value of the amount of tether in issuance. Um, in April of, of 2019, uh, there was a, uh, an investigation launched by uh, the New York AG's office into an incident in which um, the uh, exchange that is um, a, also a venture of the same company that operates Tether uh, was accused of borrowing 850 million from the Tether reserve. So Tether was essentially using its, its backup to fund a shortfall on this exchange. Um, and out of that investigation, there was a lawyer um, who was working for Tether a few days later who in a statement admitted that, um, okay, in fact, uh, not only is not all the Tether backed up by cash one-to-one, -one, but we only have 74% of the entire market cap backed up at this exact moment. Um, so indeed, Tether is uh, pretty clearly not one-to-one uh, -one and may even be significantly less than that. It's simply, it's simply not clear. Um, and if this is the case, if it's true that this peg isn't being maintained properly, it's going to have uh, pretty dramatic implications for the value of cryptocurrencies in general, but um, it certainly would have enabled the kind of manipulation that we looked at earlier, uh, in the sense that Tether could have been issued to pump the price of Bitcoin uh, and pay for its own reserves. Um, another sort of interesting incident, which is hard to quite know what to make of, happened in July of the same year, um, in which Tether accidentally uh, minted 5 billion additional Tether uh, during a change of the underlying encryption protocol um, and claimed it was a mistake involving a misplaced decimal point. Uh, but it raised a lot of questions about, you know, exactly how secure this issuing minting process was um, if you can misplace a decimal point and accidentally issue 5 billion without any uh, dollars backing it up. So I think from this case study, if there were broader conclusions that, that we would draw as, you know, as economists or as, in a, uh, you know, our, our position as specialists in this kind of litigation would be that, um, you know, the security and technical sophistication of what cryptocurrencies are and what the blockchain is, um, doesn't mean that there's any defense against uh, what you might call good old fashioned uh, currency price manipulation. So transactions that are used to pump other prices, uh, intentional uh, timed releases in order to manipulate prices. These sorts of things are still going on and indeed uh, could be going on with one of the most systemically important currencies in the crypto world, um, if, if the claims to the Griffin Chen paper are true. Um, the second bullet point is maybe a bit overblown, but I, you know, the, the idea here is that this, this uh, much of the, value of, of crypto uh, is being derived from this tether as an asset. Um, and it has quite a bit of autonomy and ability to drive value in a lot of crypto markets in the sense that large issuances can, can increase or decrease the price of Bitcoin. Um, and so that, that kind of monetary power seems to have been abrogated to a, a non-transparent and non-accountable entity, um, which uh, there's a certain irony there given many of the kind of idealistic uh, claims of cryptocurrencies in the early days was that this was a a declaration of independence from uh, arbitrary uh, monetary manipulations. Um, so whether or not Tether is actually manipulating these markets um, or you know, whether they're doing it with uh, unbacked pegs, um, either way, uh, this is obviously a, a sort of immature sector in, a, in an institutional sense. And a lot of this kind of manipulation is made possible by the lack of transparency uh, that a more robust regulatory regime is going to help out with, hopefully. So that's, uh, that's my presentation there. I don't know if we have a sort of conclusory um, session here, Darren, you're going to have to step in. Yes. Well, thank you so much to our panelists for, well, from my side, a very enlightening presentation. Um, I would say that because I am a crypto geek and I find it fascinating. Um, so now we're going to move into a question and answer session. So if I could ask any of our attendees, if they have any questions, to put it into the q and If you're using the app, you should be able to do this. If you're using a desktop, you will see Q&A at the bottom. 
if you're on a phone, I'm not sure if that's feasible. I don't think there is anyone on a phone. Let me start my video. Thank you. And I will also put up the presentation, uh, the slides. And again, apologies for before for not um, putting up my presentation <laughs> during my speech. That's a lesson learned. Um, so let's see if, let's get this slide up. Okay, well, I think there's one question and I'll just get to that in a minute. But um, first, I thought I'd, I'd kick us off uh, with a, a question for each of the panelists. Um, firstly, let's, uh, let's start in, in order of the presentation. So thank you to um, Imogen for a very interesting legal update. So um, I was just thinking, Imogen, actually, um, it seems the chicken and egg situation with regards to smart contracts, um, I heard you say, there's pretty much zero case law um, for you to call upon right now. Um, and I wondered um, if that in itself is a hindrance for the development of, of the market. Um, well, what's your view? Yeah, no, I think that's right. I think that the problem, it, you're right, it's a chicken and egg problem, that we don't have any case law, which means that people aren't entering into smart contracts. And because there are no smart contracts, they're not going wrong, and therefore we don't have any case law. Um, and I think for that reason, we probably do need um, legislative intervention, and that's going to be a way that's going to provide market confidence. And I think we sort of hoped that the legal statement would do that, but they try to answer some questions about smart contracts, and they say that they can be legally binding, but there are still so many questions and, and so many points that they haven't covered that there's not going to be confidence until there is something a bit more solid. I think there is quite easily space for a statute on that would set out how each of these would be dealt with. So I think that is something that could come, but there's been no appetite so far for the government to do it. So um, I don't know what will come of it. And, and maybe we just have to wait for people to delve into smart contracts and for them to go wrong before we see anything else. I would agree with you there, Imogen. I think it's really, with the trouble with the English legal system, well, the, the, the good thing about the English legal system is we have a common law system which evolves over time from case law and isn't fixed. Uh, I guess the less good thing is that uh, when you have a new, a new statement or, or something newly litigated or newly discussed, there isn't much to go on and we're sort of clutching law with its straws. Thank you, um, guys. And what I thought I'd do is um, I'll jump to Nigel in a moment, but let's take one of the um, questions from the virtual audience. So... Thank you for the question. Um, Henry Burrows asks me, regarding the 10th of January, SCA registration process, is the regulator still on track? Is there likely to be slippage due to COVID? Is this, so this, I guess the reference is to the ro rolling out of the Europe EU AMLD5. Um, I haven't heard anything personally, um, I think the deadline is still in place. I do know that there is an issue with regards to the second payment. I believe to comply, all firms in, in the UK have to pay a registration fee and then there's an annual fee. Thank, thank you for confirming, Henry. Um, that is something that the industry is talking about, who's what that's going to look like, how they're going to um, come up with a methodology for charging individual firms, because obviously one could understand there's many startups in the industry that perhaps don't have the runway or the, or the resources to, to, to pay these fees versus, say, the Coinbase or larger exchanges, that, that it's not so much of an issue for them to be compliant for KYC and AML. But generally, as, as I think Nigel alluded to, the industry does welcome uh, KYC and AML uh, regulations acro across the piece. And I think we could also point to uh, FATA and the uh, recommendation, recommendation 16 travel rule 
So this in, in, it's, in a short explanation is for all what they call VAT, Virtual Asset Service Providers. So that forms uh, exchanges, trading exchanges, one under this umbrella, um, have to provide sending and receiving information on, on any transaction that occurs across their platform. So that's a massive piece of work for industry right now. And there are a number of, uh, let's say, uh, solutions going on uh, around that from, from what I'm involved in in the SRO space. So this is self-regulatory organizations. So please, if, if you do have any further questions around that, uh, reach out. Uh, okay, so let's, thank you for that question. Let me now move to, to Nigel, um, specifically around your, your presentation. And you touched on consumer protection. Um, and just from, from my side, uh, we're in regular contact with, with Treasury, and this is what the, the, the task force, um, the Critical Assets Task Force, Her Majesty Treasury, are hearing from senior MPs that we have to protect consumers. And I think everyone in the industry that I speak to is well aware of that. We have to protect the vulnerable, the retail investor. But I would ask you, and whether you know about this or not, or not but just your view generally uh, around how to go about how that looks really in the crypto industry. So I know the FCA had a paper out last year in regards to um, what they termed products referencing crypto assets, so derivatives, for example, for an outright ban. So this paper was asking the industry to respond stay in regards to banning crypto derivatives completely in the UK. My two questions you are, one, do you agree with this? Um, or, and two, if not, what would you suggest? Okay, good, two good questions. Do I agree with it? No. Uh, <laughs> I'm a big crypto supporter, so in an answer, no, I don't agree with that. But I do agree that um, individuals, retail investors, do need to be protected from um, f from sort of the sort of huge volatility in crypto. Um, one of one sort of parallel I see is around CFDs in the FX industry, where there was this um, um, huge curtailment introduced by the FCA in terms of the amount of leverage people could um in, in the amount of leverage people would use to invest which has massively reduced that market but not killed it altogether uh and that was specifically for retail as opposed to um, professional investors so i see that as a potential model um i mean there are it's i remember there was this funny there was this quote about the wall street crash that somebody said they knew it was they knew they were in trouble when their shoe shine boy started giving them tips. I started I started worrying when our um, when when our in house caterer started asking me for tips on on crypto about six months ago. Um, Imagine <laughs> two years. Um, we had quite an animated discussion in the kitchen around about crypto, and that worried me quite a lot. Um, so I think there does need to be some protections in place. Um, so I don't agree with. I'm not. I'm look. I'm. I'm not. Well, I'm not one. I'm not particularly nanny state minded when it comes to crypto. But I do think there has to be some sort of limits. Yeah, it's interesting to hear your um, thoughts because I I totally agree with you, and I'm glad you referenced the what what we see in the industry as a sort of incompatibility between what the FCA is saying out of their rule book versus the CFDs, and I think the ratio is two to one that they changed it from. That's so right. Yes. Allowed as a uh, you know, a non-sophisticated investor to, to, to use. So that, in our mind, is, isn't a level playing field if a full ban comes out. And then secondly, what's to stop me opening an account on, for example, on an exchange that's gone missile out of the UK? And, and yeah. Well, absolutely. I mean, look, we, we want the UK, and it's an interesting question come up on the, on the chat around Brexit. Will there be a bifurcation um, from Peter Davey? And then I was actually, that sort of, got me thinking about it. If we want to be competitive post-Brexit, um, this is an area where the UK can excel, but within limits in a sort of relatively safe environment. Okay, thank, thank you very much for that, Nigel. Um, we'll take some questions from the, the audience now. I see there's some in the chat. Thanks for mentioning that, Nigel. Um, okay, so this is earlier. Let me just scroll down here. Okay, so this question is from Collier, Bristol. Okay, so to Nathan, the question is, I'm sure you can see it. I'll, I'll read it out for those that, that, that can't see the screen. If you have a question, oh, sorry. <laughs> the question, okay, um, from Peter Davey. 
post-Brexit sounds like quite a bifurcation of treatment between the UK and the EE. What do the panellists think? Uh, perhaps let's, let's bring Max in if you have a view of that first and then I'll open it up to the other guys. I mean, yes and no. Our, our perspective on this is litigation oriented generally um, and historically most kind of litigation in the, U in the UK along these financial instruments has followed findings by the EEA. So um, in the UK is going to have to find its own feet a little bit in terms of, uh, you know, our our world of, of bringing cases against people. I don't know if um, this sort of jurisdictional issue also that Nigel raised of, um, you know, what, is it, what does it really mean to hold an asset in, inside of a given country when you have a crypto asset, right? I mean, this is, this is not so hard of a thing to, to operate uh, remotely. And this is why it's popular and, um, you know, sort of more forms of technical fraud that people are familiar with, um, you know, uh, money laundering, these sorts of um, ideas are, are, are brought into the crypto and, and our crypto is used for these things quite a bit because the sort of jurisdictional issues are uh, much easier to get around. So, um, you know, I, I don't know that the UK is going to have uh, as sort of strong a, a re regime on this as the EU, but um, certainly they're going to have to find their own way on it. Thanks, Max. Uh, Imogen, do you have any views on, on this question? Um, yeah, I actually think that it could be quite a benefit for the UK. We have the opportunity to go in whatever direction we want to about crypto assets. We're not going to be held back by whatever the EU decides or if they're particularly slow in dealing with it. Um, I do agree with Max that in regards to litigation, it will be simply a case of will our courts will deal with it how they want to deal with it and it will progress um, outside of the EEA anyway. Um, but I think we should see it as a benefit rather than we're going to have different treatments in other places. Thanks, Imogen. Nigel, do you have anything further to add? Um, I mean, I'm not a massive fan of um, Brexit from a financial services perspective uh, and because I see the value in the likes of MIFID 2 and having a level playing field and having a, a single market. Um, having said that, I can't, I'm, I can't, I'm not King Canute and I, well, I can be like King Canute, I can stand there and tell the ways to go back, but they're not going to. Um, so um, I agree with Imogen that, that actually it could be one of the silver linings. It's, it is an area where we could make our own way um, and become more like a Switzerland or a Malta or a Gibraltar who have been quite actively, or well, very actively courting the crypto market. And were the UK to do so, I think it would be very successful because um, we're, most of the other jurisdictions which have courted crypto are by their nature very small and are generally tax havens. And I think it would give it greater credibility if it was done well here and if there were light touch, but, but secure regulation here. Mm -hmm. but thank you, guys. I'll just put my um, thoughts in as well. Thank you for the question, Peter. Yeah, I, I agree with, with, with your comments there, Imogen and, and Nigel. I personally and our members believe we have a great opportunity to promote the UK with this nascent industry. And if you... If you have a view that it's it's going to grow into something rather larger than it is now, then that's a positive for the UK to be a bit more nimble. I wouldn't advocate, and I don't advocate, for a soft touch. That's why we get involved in these public consultations, as I mentioned, to steer legislative bodies in the right way, not to stifle the industry. But the UK is very popular, and in my experience, for a hub for business, we get a lot of foreign direct investment because we have a good rule of law, um, such as what you folks do at Colliers. We have good support, um, industries uh, around tech uh, and, and great cities and, and all those other economic benefits as transportation. So I would hope with the current government having a majority and perhaps some longevity in, in, in parliament, not worrying about the next election, that we can really move forward and be a place where industry wants to come uh, and start up. So thank you for that. I, I think we'll go to my question for Max. And then there's another question there on the chat and there's more questions on the Q&A. Thank you for that. So we'll get to them in a moment. But just around stable coins, that was super interesting, Max. Thank you so much. I'm really impressed with what you guys do at FIDRS. Um, so my thoughts were, yeah, around market integrity, which was a general theme um, to, to, to your piece of manipulation. Uh, we know that this is going on and, and it brings a bad light on, on 
the majority, right? So always a small that uh, the few that spoil it for the majority. I must add that there's a number of initiatives to address market initiative, which which you may well be aware of. Um, there, there are code of conducts written by um, self regulatory organisations. There's blockchain analytics companies that that provide reports on 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 crime and manipulation. And some of them are our members. Um, and then we also have companies that are specifically producing products for trading exchanges that show any, say, wash trading or spoof trading, uh, to, to use uh, financial markets parlance. Um, and please, I apologize if I assumed anyone's knowledge, please reach out if you have a question it, it, uh, later on on my email address. Um, yeah, so to get to my question, um, yeah, what is my question? Yeah, so regarding the development of stable coins, they're obviously a hot topic happening for the last year since Libra, but Libra's obviously taken some back steps as we've seen in the media. But there are a number of um, other stable coins out there uh, other than Tether that, in my experience, do use a good um, third party assessment to make sure that, that stable coins. Um, are being uh, locked away one to one. You know, in your experience, uh, at Max, do you see some of these other stable coins as perhaps becoming more uh, permeated into society? Could you envisage today where they are actually used as a, a means of uh, uh, exchange, which is obviously the, the the idea behind Bitcoin, but that that's not happened at this stage. Yeah, I mean, in in a sense, one of the one of the kind of interesting consequences of the the year of scandals that the tethers had in 2019, I think, is that it 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 remains, and in fact, only has been since uh, autumn of last year, um, the most widely used uh, stablecoin in the world. You know, largely because of it was one of the first, or at least one of the first sort of big ones. Um, but because of these, you know, because of these sort of issues and all of the, the, the paper coming out and the New York AG's investigation, um, and a lot of investors kind of becoming disillusioned with their opacity. Um, a lot of a lot of new stables have uh, come in with their their business model and their value proposition for crypto markets is look we're not like them we're totally totally clean and we're super super explicit about it um, and I think what's inhibiting the adoption of those things is not uh, any kind of uh, you know shadiness on the part of these lesser coins or uh, any kind of flaws in their their disclosure processes I think what's keeping tether on top for the moment is is simply network effects the fact that this is an established player that, that is sort of, you know, breathing all the oxygen in the room. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that one of the benefits of, you know, maybe a slightly uh, more heavy handed, if sort of pejorative connotations out of that phrase, um, regulatory approach is that you might, uh, you know, put some oxygen back in the room for, uh, you know, a, a more um, responsible, you know, uh, assuming the allegations have something to them, uh, a more, at least more transparent, uh, de facto, you know, stable, kind of uh, currency and, and medium of exchange for the crypto world. And for, you know, for people who want to dip a toe in or be involved without becoming, you know, totally, totally building large proportions of their personal assets in, in cryptocurrency. Yeah, just to pivot back to the EU consultation. Yeah, we, we as an industry do not believe stable coins to be e-money and should not fall under EMD2. Uh, Directive. So they they suggested on this non paper through three options: a bespoke legislative measure, which which I believe will come. Um, Sober coins are, as I said, a hot topic, and they're a big focus for governments right now because they fear that the stable coin could potentially impact on on the domestic currency. Um, and then the other options that they're, they're, they're suggesting is to limit issuance of services related to stable coins in the EU. Um, I don't think that's that's realistic um, either. Um, so yeah, we're, we're looking for a bespoke uh, regime for stable coins down the line. I, I would um, completely agree with that. I mean, I've been advising on stable coins for a while, and they don't fit within any existing category. And I think it's a real squeeze trying to sort of define them as e-money because they're not really e-money. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, they're used for. Uh, interestingly, I've seen your comments on it here, which I completely agree, which is that stable coins and e-money are created for two completely different purposes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've got this trying to stick a round peg into a, a square hole situation right now. So we'll, we'll hopefully see some good thinking there. All right, so we have a few minutes left. Um, apologies if your question didn't get answered. Let me go to the Q&A here. Um, Graham Walker is asking the panel, what dictates 
for CITES of crypto assets for the UK tax purposes. Perhaps that's one for either Imogen or, or Nigel. Do you have a stab at that? <laughs> Imogen, all yours. <laughs> well, I, yeah, so um, the HMRC gave a, a guidance in December 2019, um, and they quite simply said that whilst you are UK residents, the status of any crypto assets of a UK resident will be in the UK. Um, so there's some slight quirks, whether if you're only resident in the UK for a small amount of time, but for UK residents, it'll just all be in the UK and they'll be taxed as such. Thank you. Um, interestingly enough that, that we see this, going back to the taxonomy, um, yeah, and again, uh, Nigel, I, I didn't really use that term at all either before crypto, but uh, yeah, the HMRC, we do a lot of work with them. Um, they've issued guidance, so I suggest if you, anybody doesn't know how to handle their crypto assets, there's two pieces of guidance on their website, which is very interesting, both for retail and, and corporates. But they class um, crypto assets in the same way uh, as property and a tax uh, under the CGT uh, regime, but you have a threshold of, of £12,000, so don't worry if you only do a little bit of trading yourself. But... Um, no, okay, so we've got two minutes left. I think there was another, what, there was a Q&A. Let me go to, was there a question on the chat? In about, uh, about oh. Tether. Here we are. Yes, so final question from David Henson. Thank you for, specifically for Nigel. On the face of it, it seems that a stable coin like Tether might meet the definition of e-money. For example, the payment service rates would seek to avoid the one-to-one -one backing problem required by funds to be safeguarded or adequately insured. Do you know whether any sterling stablecoin have fit within this framework? I'm not aware of a sterling stablecoin. I've come across other stablecoins in other currencies, and I can't really say what they are because probably it's it'll be giving away client confidentiality, but I've certainly dealt with some in other currencies. Um, and the, I mean, it's basically it's a bit of a juggle around e money with stablecoins. There are certain um, characteristics of e-money one of the key ones is that they the e-money is redeemable against the issuer and that's not always the case with stable coin because the stable because typically e-money is used basically to buy buy things it's, it's like pre-existing issuing pre-existing tokens to spend in a in one particular shop or in one particular with one particular brand and the whole point of stable coin is it it's 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 widely used for a range of things it's used more like money uh, more like money than e-money, though that's strange though that may sound. Mm -hmm. um, so could Heather be an e-money? I don't know enough about, the, I mean, it's a, it's a technical point. It's a, it's a technical point around the issuance and redemption in terms mm -hmm. of whether it fits within this definition of e-money, and I don't know enough to tell you the answer mm -hmm. um, uh, in terms of how Tether, exactly how Tether's structured when you, if you, if you, um, what to redeem it, Heather? Who do you redeem it against? Yeah, just as a, a, a final point, well, I would have, we see the stable coins set up quite frequently within ecosystems of trading exchanges. I haven't seen any sterling uh, stable coins, but one could expect if a large exchange set up an operation in the UK, and I think we'll see, you know, Coinbase here, but we may see other exchanges come shortly. That, that may be something that is available. All right, it's 31 minutes past. One final quick question, then we'll wrap up. Thank you ever so much, everyone. This is an anonymous question and the question is if holder of cryptocurrency receive reward through basic wallet operations for its contribution to network security this may be considered security taken anyone want to take a stab at that um, it was like a taxonomy question yeah <laughs> it definitely is where does it fit within the three categories guys let, let, let's all go to each person What do you think, Nigel? Security I think token. it's probably a utility token. Nigel got uh, utility token. Fine. Imogen, what do you think? I'm going to agree with Nigel because he's definitely the expert in that area. <laughs> <laughs> well done. That's two for utility. Max, what do you think? Or be it for me to overturn the consensus, uh, but I would say, <laughs> how does the market treat it? Does it trade properly? Does it, you know, does value... I mean, I'm assuming. I'm assuming. I mean, I, it's a good point, Max. I'm assuming that really this is this is something which is just between the issuer and the and the buyer. It's some. Ostensibly, it seems like a utility token. 
Yeah, I, I agree with all the other panelists. It, 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 if it, in its simplest form, the question is around you perform, you provided some level of uh, utility service, let's call it computing power, electricity, or you know, some file storage for a, the, a, a benefit and you receive um, a token. That, that to me is, is a so simple. Anonymous might want a legal opinion on this because <laughs> do not rely, do not rely on, on a panel discussion. And, okay, and so should, should, uh, this, none of this is legal advice. Everybody. Yeah, this is not legal advice and Anonymous should not go and spend large amounts of money investing in some structure without getting proper advice. All right. Well, that's that's a wrap, I think, from our side. So uh, again, I'd like to thank all our panelists, um, Imogen, Jones, Nigel, Brahams, and Max. It's been an interesting afternoon. I look forward to seeing all you folks again. And, and thanks for our audience and colleagues for, for uh, hosting today. Take care, everybody. Thank you, thank you very much. Bye-bye.